Hello, folks, and welcome to Got Your Back, NHL edition, LeBron and Rashog, brought to you by Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals. Got a fantastic podcast on the way today. Dallas Stars superstar forward Jason Robertson in conversation with Pierre Lebrun and I. Did you know that he is a big analytics guy? Talked in depth about some of his own analytics and some things that he's looking for and was looking for improvement this year in his game. Real interesting conversation with a very interesting, very high-end player in the National Hockey League. Got your backs. Brought to you by Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals, providing some of the uh, providing equipment and supplies to all facets of the Canadian construction industry. But what really sets them apart is their get her done attitude. It's a core value of the company. I have been there. They have it proudly displayed on the walls. Every one of the staff members lives by that get her done formula to ensure they never let the customer down. Cross Country Canada takes great pride in this attitude, and they truly believe that their customer success is their success. As we check in with the fellas, Pierre Lebrun and uh, MJ, Mike Johnson. Johnny, another day, another podcast, another background, uh, another different wallpaper behind you. What, uh, <laughs> what city, what hotel, where the heck are you, pal? Clearly a hotel. They all kind of look the same. I'm in Montreal right now. I've been in Montreal for the last couple of days. Uh, saw them beat your Oilers, Shoggy, uh, quite handily on Super Bowl Sunday. And they're playing in a bit of a turtle Oilers. derby uh, against Chicago uh, on Tuesday night here. So, uh, yeah, I'm in Montreal, which I like. I've been in Montreal for a while. I, you know, I quite like the city. I like being around here. So, although, you know what? I'm at that age. I went and played tennis yesterday. And I haven't played tennis as much as I want to. Yeah. And... I, like I'm so sore, like I, you know, I wasn't even playing that hard, but I'm at that age where like I, I need to get over the hump where I am no longer sore after playing tennis. How many sets? How many sets did you it play? Was, it was like 45 minutes of a pretty that's a good intensive hit. Yeah, it was it was relatively it, intense. So I'm like it, indoor oh, tennis. I hope indoor do. beautiful <laughs> yeah. clay, little private club. It was really really nice. I, I quite it was it was lovely. But, but yeah, by, I was, by the way, what time do we think? Uh, what time do we think the order got into montreal saturday from ottawa from the afternoon game in ottawa ah never mind why do you early. ask pierre what are you saying pierre <laughs> goodness sakes they're professionals I don't know that team looked ready on sunday <laughs> yeah, and the ugly, thing was eh? pierre the thing was they were staying over after the game they were staying to watch the super bowl like you know, it was the last game right. of a road trip so they they got the carrot like listen guys let's play Montreal. let's win the game and then we'll hang out we'll have not a party but you know we'll super bowl together as a team sure. and then we'll fly home the next day so they kind of kind of dropped the ball of that one yeah that was an interesting one and, and you know the thing about those uh the thing about those road trips johnny like you know this when you're flying home from a road trip you're not really thinking about what your last result was you're thinking about how do we do on the trip overall like you, you're mm-hmm. and there was, there was a four game road trip and they went in there against the montreal canadians who they should be able to beat with the chance to get on that plane and fly home feeling really good about a road trip in which quite frankly their play wasn't great and they just laid an absolute egg. Like I, I, a more mature team goes in and grabs that game by the throat, realizing the value of that win to the road trip, to the party after the game, to all of those things. Hang. So yes and no. Yes, like you'd like to have them be, like you know, a little more prepared, put up a better effort. But no, like is Tampa a mature team? I've seen Tampa drop the ball against terrible, like bad teams. I've seen them lose. Yep. Like you know, the best teams in the league. Lose, other than Boston, lose two teams and lose the teams at the bottom of the standings. The Maple Leafs do it all the time. Tampa's done it all the time. The thing about that one was weird, though, is that they could have been maybe in first place had they won that game if mm. Vegas would have not gotten the result. So, yeah, it was surprising, sure. But the idea that because you're a top team and the Oilers are and you're playing a bottom team and the Canadians are, you should win every time. Montreal is going to win four to, the ne- four to every 10 games the rest of the way. So they're beating someone, including teams at the top of the standings. So it's not a shock that they lost maybe a shock of how they played while losing. This is why, I mean, this is why I don't know why people gamble on hockey, by the way, but the, the March <laughs> games in particular are ridiculous because I'm telling you, the teams at the bottom of the standings win so many games in the stretch run where there's no pressure on them and, and you got tired, stressed out teams trying to make the playoffs. And I don't know, it's, it's chaos in the uh, parody NHL. While we're talking about the Edmonton Oilers, let's just dive right into the topic du jour. And a big topic du jour is going to be trades. So let's start there. Uh, You know, CJ reported over the weekend that maybe Oilers and Sharks have re-engaged on a potential Eric Carlson trade. 
Uh, we've got Chikrin sitting out games because potentially uh, there's a trade there. I don't believe it's with the Edmonton Oilers, but Chikrin has been connected to Edmonton at times. They clearly need a blue liner. Let's start with the headline, though. MJ, when you hear Edmonton Oilers, Eric Carlson, potential trade, what pops into the mind of Mystic Mike? excitement at what that would look like on the ice. Eric Carlson is having an incredible year. You add his puck moving and puck transporting skills to a team that already can do that as well as anyone with some high-end guys. And you think about what could be. So on the ice, you think, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I would want him. Everyone should want him on their team. But I thought we just talked to Ken Holland. I thought he just said dollar in, dollar out. I'm pretty sure Carlson makes 11 and a half for like the next four years. How is this possibly going to work? Like, even if you send Yessi Pugliarvi, Tyson Berry, what is that, seven and a half million dollars? And maybe if the Sharks eat four or five, they kind of dollar for dollar, and then you'd start dumping in the picks and the Borgos and the other prospects that have to go along with the salary equivalent. I just, like, I get why you want it. I didn't know the Oilers would be able to take that on, not just this year, but for all those other years going forward, because at some point, you know, they're going to have to re-sign Leon as well coming up. Like, they're already extraordinarily top-heavy. Adding another $11.5 million player makes them, you know, very, even heavier at the top here. I just, like, I see why, but I just also wonder if it's feasible and smart How? to do it. Yeah, this is one of those things where the hockey side and the cap side are counterintuitive here in this storyline. And um, I mean, I, I was thinking the other day, and I should have done the research for this before this, but I forgot. Has a Norris Trophy winner ever been traded in season? I don't mm. think so. I mean, Eric mm. Carlson could win the Norris Trophy this year, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And be he a candidate for the heart. So... Wouldn't that be something? Uh, I, I, I listen. I mean, can you imagine the Oilers' power play, which is already the best in the NHL, with Eric Carlson at quarterback? <laughs> I mean, that's like we're bringing back coffee, Curry, and Gretzky here. Um, but the financial part of it, and maybe it's it's just that I wasn't very good at math. It, it just stuns me. I can't get my mind around how this deal could work. I get it. I've seen the. I actually do. Well, what I'm saying is it just seems like so much effort as to how this deal would work. Now, the, a little intel that I want to throw in here because there were uh, reports over the weekend that, you know, the Sharks have a have a max that they can retain on Carlson and that that is really the big problem, not just for Edmonton, for any other team trying to trade for Carlson, is that the Sharks aren't willing to eat enough in a Carlson deal. What I was told uh, on Monday by a shark source is that that is not true that the sharks have not told anyone here's how far we're willing to go it really depends on how the deal develops right hmm. i mean hmm. the more you go the more you get back i mean it, it, it's sort of all intertwined that way so i thought it was important to point that out well they do have a max the max being 50 percent. yeah yeah sorry I, I, but what i'm saying yeah, is I, I, the they're already of, they're already retaining know. on burns and if to do mm -hmm. a deal with right. edmonton it's got to be 40%. Like, they need to take $5 million, 5. right? Yeah. Four, four, yeah. four to $5 million. So now, for four more years, like, I understand total teardowns and rebuilds, and I understand that. But sometimes it kind of happens faster than you think. And maybe in two years, you're surprised at where you're at, and now you've hamstrung right. yourself. So for an organization that's trying to pull a 180 here, I don't know, four years at $4.5 retention? Like, that... That feels like a big ask, even for a team that's tearing it down the way the Sharks are, Johnny. It is a yeah. big ask, and, and that's the problem. And that is the inherent difficulty in this deal. It's not Eric Carlson. It's not even the salary. It's the term. It's the fact that he has so much left. It's the problem for the acquiring team. It's the acquiring for the eating team. If that's San Jose, you don't want to have seven, eight, nine million dollars of retained salary on your books going forward for three, four years, because um, that, that does hurt you. So uh, I, I don't know, Pierre, if it's ever going to get done, it's going to get, we've talked about this. It should get done this year. If you're going to go for it, you got to go and try to do it this year. Um, I could see, you know, if you eat the four or five, you get down to $7 million. You can make the salaries match up by, you know, I just said Tyson Berry and Yessi Pugliarvi, that's $7 million. And then you have to add in all the other players for the, for the value of the retained salary, plus the value of Eric Carlson, which is a lot. 
Um, but just going yeah. forward, it still makes it hard for the Oilers to kind of round out the rest of their team. So I don't know, Pierre. It's funny. It's fun to think about. What do you right. think the likelihood of it actually happening this yeah, year? Yeah, let's put a percentage on it. Yeah, I I, I think it's, uh, you know, 10 to 20 percent that it happens before March mm. 3rd. I, I think it's a lot more likely still this summer where there's more flexibility and teams can live over the cap for a few yep. months and figure out the rest. I, I, I just, and I'm not saying for Edmonton, I'm saying San Jose in general, being mm. able to complete a Carlson deal. Um, and, and, you know, we had on our, on our podcast and I think some of the telling comments in that interview um, were that winning would trump almost everything in his decision. Remember, he has the full no move. And, and, and to be honest, we still don't know whether he would wave to go to Edmonton. I've tried mm. to find that out. Um, I don't know the, the answer to that question. Um, but don't forget that whole part of it, too, which actually really seemed to be forgotten all weekend with all this, that Eric Carlson has the ultimate say. I, I To me, I, I think it's a solid deal, if at all, but, uh, but we'll see. You know, uh, the thing for the Sharks to me is this, too. Is there a chance that Eric Carlson is this great again next year? Sure there is. Sure there is. But he may not be, based on the last couple of years as well. And so you get why, if you're San Jose, the summer's maybe a better time. But boy, in the moment right now, he is sizzling. He may never again. I you got to strike. Because, strike while yeah, the iron is so hot. You have you to. Strike. And, and like respect, if he even is this good again, what does it help San Jose? Like they're not going to be right. good, right? So like he's having a historically good year, and they are nowhere near the playoffs. And I don't think you know, you know, as good as he's been, they're not piling into the Shark Tank to watch Eric Carlson play. Like I, I think it's just his greatness is not matching up with what they are as an organization. And I think that's why you, I would, I would swing now if you can get anything remotely like what is being bandied about, even if you have to eat four or five. I would be inclined to try to pull it off now. And and, and by the way, <laughs> you know, this this is a very complicated deal if it happens at all. And the deal that actually is, is going to happen for sure. Well, I shouldn't say for sure because because he's not a UFA, but the deal that clearly probably needs more attention from Mike Greer is Timo Meyer, mm -hmm. who, in my opinion, will be the most impactful player traded at this year's trade deadline. And and so it's just interesting if you were in that San Jose Sharks war room right now and and navigating all these phone calls, uh, there's a lot going on. Also flushing out like $20 million in players in like a span of a week. Like, I mean, like, mm. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Like you're talking about a quarter of the cap will be gone in two days in two players. Yeah. Makes payroll every two weeks easier for whoever's got that job. <laughs> I guess <laughs> like, so. <laughs> a little more of those crazy checks running through. Uh, just quickly, last on the Edmonton Oilers, uh, what about this logic, Johnny? Because, well, both of you, for the Oilers to add Eric Carlson, they got to subtract Tyson Berry. So the asset cost, and it sounds like it's like multiple first round caliber assets, two, three, maybe, good prospect, that sort of thing. So if you're the Edmonton Oilers and you add Eric Carlson, in order to add Eric Carlson, you got to subtract Tyson Berry. Now, Barry runs the best power play in the league and has mm -hmm. for the last number of years. Barry is underrated in terms of how well he's playing for the Oilers overall. I'm not mm -hmm. comparing him to Eric Carlson and saying that he's in that hemisphere. What I'm saying right. is, is if the Oilers give up three first-round caliber assets, they're not adding Eric Carlson. They're adding the difference between Eric Carlson and Tyson Barry because mm -hmm. you're subtracting a pretty darn good mm -hmm. player too. So is it yeah. worth that asset cost to swap those guys out for the amount that you improve? Yeah, so I, I think the delta between Barry and Carlson at 5-on-5 five five is massive. Massive. I understand that Tyson Barry's not having a bad year, but it's massive. I don't think the delta on the power play is that significant. And so you're, you're weighing those two different things. Like, yeah. I don't expect as, as tremendous as the talent would be, like, is the power play going to be 40%? It's already the second best power play in the last 45 years. Yeah. Only like the 72 Islanders. You want to were, mess with it? Were, yeah. Well, not just mess with it. Like how much better can it be? A percentage mm -hmm. point or two? You're not yeah. going to go from 20 to 35. You might go from 32 to 33. So that's not going to help you. Where he'll help, where Carlson will be different than Barry five is not five. the power play. Yeah. Five on five, Pierre. He's got and more I think points than McDavid at even strength. That difference is massive between and Carlson and every own. other play driving yeah. guy, Pierre. Yeah. Transition game. I mean... Few people do better than Eric Carlson. 
Um, I should also, the other thing is, I, I think there have been reports that maybe the ask is three first round picks. Uh, Mike Greer came out publicly and denied that to Corey Massack of the Athletic. Uh, so that is not accurate, I guess. But what if it's like, when he says three first round it's like, so maybe it's Evan Bouchard, who was a first rounder, whether it's Evan yeah. Borgo, who was and a first I'm talking rounder. about picks, in a 40 percent first round pick. And in a 40 yeah. percent retention scenario, Pierre, you're That's telling right. me that if they retain 40 percent, yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Like the ask will change based, and the Oilers need to ask them to retain a pile. So you'd think mm -hmm. it would be at least two, if not more. And, and that's part of what Ken Holland has talked about, not just with us last week, but in other interviews recently, is that whatever they do, they're probably going to have to get a current roster player going out. And so how much does this trade augment who they are right now? And yeah. that's, you know, that's a tough conversation. You're not just, you know, some teams – like you look at Carolina lost Max Max Pacioretty. Carolina gets to just add, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. they, they don't they don't have to take anything away other than someone moves down the lineup if you know if they trade for Team Wire or, or whatever, you know, and it is going to have to materially affect their roster if they do something tangible with trade deadline, which is which is part of the conversation. Johnny, you get bonus points for this segment for your wicked intelligent use of the word Delta. That was tight. <laughs> Honestly, I'm sitting here trying to describe it. And if you're watching the pod, you can see me doing this like with my hands and trying to illustrate this. And you're like, yeah, man, that's the delta, the delta between them. Can you yeah. translate that quick? Like the difference between two? That's it. He just translated it for me. The difference it's between two. It's, it's, it's my finance degree term. I love exactly. having a finance a guy either. on the pod yeah. when we're talking Rolling cap. Green, baby. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay, you touched on Timo Meyer. Uh, lots of different teams potentially attached. Uh, the Winnipeg Jets pop up all of a sudden in that conversation with Kevin Day off doing a little bit of scouting here and there. Johnny, what's your gut, man? Well, like, who, who is most likely to go out and grab this guy? I, I think Carolina makes sense because Carolina also likes to acquire that they not strictly rentals and Meyer might not be able to do that. They have the easiest way to fit him because his salary is actually less than the guy they've lost for the year. So they can just, other than the assets having to give up to get him, they don't have to do any cap gymnastics to get him in under this year. Um, so I think they make the most sense. And then I, you know, I think about the other teams that are very motivated. I won't quite say desperate yet, but I, you know, I think does can Toronto find a way to just kind of give that a whirl? Does Winnipeg find a way to give that a whirl? Um, you know, teams like that. Does the team, like, does Vegas look at him now that they don't have Mark Stone for the rest of the year? Those kind of teams mm -hmm. that may be financially a little more complex, but the desperation level is super high. I think those team kind of teams, Pierre, because um, he's the guy, he's the piece you set, you trade a ton for. Because he's the finishing piece. He's not yeah. getting you to the playoffs. He's take he's helping you go deep potentially all the way in the playoffs because that's how good he is. That's how much he's going to cost. So I look at the teams that have a chance to do that when I think about who might acquire Meyer. Man, and and you just love his game too. He plays a oh, hard so game. Good. I mean, yeah. he's, he's he's the complete package. Um, I think New Jersey's super motivated. I've met them right. a ton of times over the past couple of weeks, but my understanding is there were there have been more talks in the last forty eight hours between the Devils and Sharks. Um, and so I think Tom Fitzgerald's pretty motivated to try and find a fit there for the Devils. But that deal would hinge not only on on finding the final package, which I think will include has to include three assets, but also um, I I don't know that the Devils would be comfortable trading for Timo Meyer unless he signed to an extension. And uh, my understanding, as we tape this, is that the agent Claude Lemieux still has not been given permission to speak directly to teams, which is fine. I think what Mike Greer is probably doing is I'm bringing all these trade talks close to the finish line with a couple of teams and I know what's on the table. And then, you know, maybe I bring in the agent. I also, you know, I can't name the team at this point, but I, I can tell you that I spoke to a team in the last 24 hours that said, Hey, we'll trade for him without signing him, by the way, mm -hmm. we'll worry about that later. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if they rent them out, they rent them out. So it's not not so, so some teams are coming at this a little differently. The one thing about the Leafs is that I love it from a Leafs fit perspective. I mean, what's not the like? I don't understand it from the Sharks perspective because the Sharks are looking around at the kind of prospects they're looking for or the kind of assets they want. I don't know how the Leafs match up with, for example, New Jersey or Carolina. First round um, pick. 
Matthew Nyes, Rasmus Sandin. Well, but I mean, hasn't Kyle Dubas come out and said he's not trading Matthew Nyes? I mean... So, so, so if Connor McDavid's available, Matthew's Nyes off the table? Like, at some point, like, I know okay. he's a top prospect, but what are we talking about here? He's a dude, it, it, I get it. It seemed pretty definite. The way I know, Pierre, week, but, but like, but... heaven forbid the uh, GM gives you some misdirection in one of his pressers that he's going to go a different direction. And, I know. Like, and, and when I say this, this is not That's to disrespect not been Matthew Nyes. Style, though. It's, it's, it's has backed up what he said though over the years. Sure, but like yeah. it's a compliment to Matthew Nyes that we're having this kind of conversation. Yeah, that they think that he's that good. So it's not about me saying that he's not going to be a good NHL player. But let's be honest, he's a college player. He's got forty-five points in thirty games. Really good prospect. Like you're a team that's trying to win a Stanley Cup, whether it's a or somebody else with a Matthew Nyes like prospect. Like, yeah, isn't it worth it to take a what if? He becomes this and go get a guy who we know is already that. Like I, 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 I the hesitation. I get it. Long term, backfilling entry level contracts. I just think like sometimes you got to trade the young guys. You're going with a known commodity. And and certainly when it comes to the least first round pick, I could. I mean, I would if I were Carl Dubas, I could care less about that set. Yeah, I don't mean care less. Like it has no value. I mean that player. Is won't be a lead for five years. Like, come on. I mean, right. I mean, if if you can get something tangible with that first round pick, I mean, the and you can't. I get it. Like, I, I, you know, I think I give Kyle Dubas a lot of credit because it just seems like he's he's been able to push out all the noise about him being on an expiring deal on the Leafs not winning a first round series in forever. I think he's doing a good job of saying I'm not letting those things affect my conversation with teams at the deadline it's commendable the same way he asks but, players to do it every time they're in the last year they're a contract commendable my ah, well, we talk about pierre no, no, but, he's sitting but, in a press but, box about, who cares if he doesn't have a contract i know but that's what i'm saying the point i'm about to get to is this <laughs> i think it should matter i think those factors actually should affect this deadline hmm. i don't he doesn't have a contract i i don't think they should No, the fact that this team has to finally win. Oh yeah, of course that and, matters. And and, yeah. and and I think you know, I understand like a lot of, especially in the analytics community. Well, there's so much randomness in the playoffs for sure. That's the mm -hmm. salary cap. I mean, there's parity. But you know what? Colorado goes out and gets our Terry Lekkinen, which wasn't exactly a trade where people spoke hours about on on uh, leading into trade deadline day last year. He scores a series clinching goal in the Western Final. And the series clinching goal in the Stanley Cup final, you can absolutely impact your team in a way that gives you that little nudge over the top. And I don't know, if I were the Leafs, it would absolutely be the all in year, which I think is something that the Leafs disagree with that philosophy. Hmm. That guy's hmm. name's Ivan Barbashev. That's that's this year's lacking in for right. Tor Toronto. Like not the for sexiest sure. I guy, love him, but a guy. You've mentioned player. him a few times, yeah. Johnny. You've mentioned him a yeah. few times yeah. as a possibility. Yeah. Hey, you like that one? I, I, I wrote his name this week in my yeah. least athletic piece. I, I, yeah. I like Barbashev and Jake McCabe as you know medium ads for the Leafs at, at, at each position. Not the big sexy headliners, but yeah. And by the way, Jake McCabe, player. Jake McCabe is that player that has the seven team no trade list, and so all seven Canadian teams raise their eyebrow and go, huh? Uh, I think the Oilers would have huge interest in Jake McCabe. Mm. I don't know that Jake McCabe uh, is doing that. But I think he would be a guy that the Oilers would absolutely target. But it sounds like maybe Toronto would be the Canadian option if there is a Canadian option for Jake McCabe. It's amazing, too, though. Like, respectfully, Chicago's a great city. Chicago's a mess on the ice. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be right. for a few years, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, while you may think, well, do I want to go live in Toronto or in Edmonton or whatever? Like, do like as much as it's great to live in Chicago, if your team's crap and they're crap and they're going to be for a bit, like it, like the the magnificent mile is great and all, but like it's not fun to be in Chicago if you don't yeah. win. So when Jake like, McCabe that, arrived in Chicago, he talked different. about how, it was his plan. His plan right. was to get to Chicago. That's where his family wanted to be. He hoped right. to be able to play there, and he got there. Mm -hmm. But I think he's a competitor, and there's frustration yep. at, at where things are at. So sounds like he's willing to go. It's just I don't know if a trip to Edmonton is necessary because I think we would be hearing tons about mm -hmm. the Oilers on Jake McCabe if he was willing to come to well, Edmonton. And the other thing is, you know, I tweeted this out over the weekend, but the asking price from the Hawks, I think <laughs> some eyebrows were raised. Price By is high way, this year, really? But, price is high. But uh, you know, they are telling teams that it's uh, it's at least a first round pick right now. But if the Hawks 
make him a $2 million player instead of a $4 million player, mm. it's a first plus. And, um, you know, people are complaining about the price for Jacob Chikrin, but uh, there you go. They mm. want the Brandon Hagel discount, right? He's a good exactly. player, but the contract makes him even more valuable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned Jake Chikrin. Let's go there. Uh, interesting strategy here from Arizona. This, you know, the, When that first comes out, that they're sitting him out for trade reasons. And by the way, I thought it was really smart of them to do this. Because if there wasn't a ton of action on him, it probably stirred some up. But you get the impression that this must be really close. I mean, who sits a player out for trade reasons unless the player is imminently about to be traded? So whether something was close and then fell through, whether it is actually close or not, uh, Pierre, what's what's your information on kind of where this thing sits and and why they're do and and Johnny, I guess, why what do we think about the fact that they're doing this? Go ahead, Pierre. Well, I think the first thing that's interesting is that when he was scratched on Saturday, that the teams that I think you know have been trying on him and and that I think remain in the mix were caught off guard. Uh, so, which is suggest that if this trade was close with the team, it wasn't with the teams that are, that uh, I was talking to <laughs> who, who would like to get him. Right. If that makes any sense. So I don't know that something was close. I think that they're just playing. I think they're just being smart with the asset here. A player who has come back from a number of injuries and has had a great year, but Hey, what a nightmare if he goes out and blocks a shot in a meaningless game with the Arizona Coyotes. So I, I think that's what this is more about. Um, and now it's about, uh, obviously manufacturing that trade between now and March 3rd, you know, th th this, is a, a delicate area, uh, as long as the player, by the way, is fine with all this and sounds like he is, then it's no big deal. But, you know, remember when Taylor Hall a couple of years ago, when he was with the doubles and sat out a couple of games with the, uh, in December <laughs> while the doubles were working on a trade. And this is an area where NHLPA sometimes will poke their nose in it because it's like, well, how long are you sitting this guy out? Mm -hmm. Like, like what's happening here? Um, but in this case, I think, uh, I think everyone's on the same page. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing and you're right. Froggy, like no better way to ramp up a return call. Like if any team was circling, thinking we have a couple more weeks to get our best offer in there, you maybe think, Oh, I got a couple hours to get my best offer in there. Yeah. So let's just, let's put it on the table and see if it's good enough. Curious too, because you say that Chikrin is okay with this, and it makes sense that he would be because he's been wanting out of there for a long time. Yeah, because I can't remember a deadline player being set out three weeks in advance. It's kind of like the last three, four, five days, but not right. the last three weeks. And I think some players like yeah. Taylor Hall would have a problem with that. And I don't know. I mean, listen, you don't have to play players. That's that's the rules of the, the CBA. But I'm not sure if sitting guys out for trade reasons. I could see the PA wanting to kind of like, hang on, this, I don't know if we're entirely okay with like one month, two months, three, like how long can you do right. this for if it's just for reasons? But um, Chikrin wants out and he's had, and it's worth noting, he's had a fantastic year. Like not yeah, just okay, yeah. excellent year on a bad team. And you think about what he could do on a better team with more support around him. That's why acquiring teams would be, have him at four and a half million dollars for a couple more years is an absolute steal for how good he is. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I mean, it was so widely reported that, to, that it was LA to the point where LA apparently had to go call their top prospects and say, uh, Brant Clark, yeah, you're not, not getting you. traded, you know, like it's not you, which is, which tells you how strangely public this became when it wasn't consummated shortly after. Um, no so in that sense, it's been a little bit untidy. Yeah. I, I, I put the Kings in a tough spot because they still want the player. But they sort of had to respond over the weekend and say, we're not close to dealing for him. Mm -hmm. And I think my sense is they were a bit confused about what was going on because they clearly were not told that they were out either because they're still, I think the Kings still want him. Um, but what's been interesting in that whole thing, I, I can't imagine there's a team that's called Arizona more than LA over the past year and a half. So Pierre. Uh, it's been, always been the natural fit. They need a top four on the left side. They're loaded on the right side. But there's a very simple reason why it hasn't happened to this point is that the, the, they've, the Kings have said that price is too much for them. And so here we go, the poker game. Do you th so do you think that Chicker was getting set out for a specific team or just for protection? And if it was a specific team, was it not LA? Had to be a specific team. It had feels be, like that, but I'm what, I feel that's what Pierre's here to tell me. Mm, not so sure? I'm not so sure. Okay. Interesting. But so I'm then, not so sure. 
I'm literally not so sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you said I'm not so sure with this look on your face. Yeah. That's like, I might be yeah. sure, but I'm not sure I'm sure. And I mean, no, he's yeah. like, he's checking right now. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, uh, <laughs> I, and listen, I, play makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think there are teams that may pop out of, because this guy's signed. Just keep an eye on this. May not necessarily have to be a playoff team. The other thing is, uh, I reported this last week, but and I can't tell to which degree they keep checking, but the Boston Bruins have been quiet. I was different. just going to ask yeah. about is yeah. Boston going to surprise the hell out of everybody? So here they are, one, yeah. three, and one in their last five. And not that um, it's panic time in any way, shape, or form, but what do you think? Um, you know, they, well, I know they've inquired. What I don't know is, is this just due diligence? How yeah. much do we like this player? Are they in there heavy? Um, so that's an interesting team mm. to keep an eye on for sure. Can you imagine yeah. them? If you go with like McAvoy and Grizzlick and Lindholm and Chikrin, like what are we talking about? <laughs> What's happening? And, like what are the good luck rolling out against that group? Man. That'd yeah. definitely be something. All right, boys. That's a great segment. Lots of good trade chatter in there. Um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens here over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, Johnny, you weren't part of our interview with Jason Robertson. Pierre, you and I had a great chance to chat with him yesterday. Johnny, before we get to that interview, I'll just ask you for your impressions of the year Robertson is having. He's on that 50-goal pace. And this is a guy who uh, pays attention to his own analytics, Johnny, which he's going to talk about in this interview. He knew how many shots he had blocked last year. Uh, he knew, you know, all sorts of different things about his own game from an analytical standpoint, which he's, he spoke very intelligently about that stuff. That says something. He th he's thinking it on that level. My kind of guy, my kind of guy who wants information. You call it analytics. I call it information. Right. He wants information as to what is happening on the ice and how he can be better at it. It's amazing. First off, I give him full credit. He's established. He doesn't need training camp. Yeah. brilliant rest of his career never <laughs> needs training camp. crazy five games Ideal. into the year after coming back from missing training camp he went on an 18 game heater like it was that's ridiculous it. never needs it never will have to ask for it again so that's first off also i think what makes him really unique is that he's not great at any one thing perhaps like not the biggest not the fastest not the strongest can't shoot the hardest except his brain obviously is, is great and that's what allows him yeah. to manipulate um and you talk about what's interesting so he has a very long stick relative to his height. And I think a lot more players now are paying attention to how many shots of theirs get blocked. It's, it's a real part of like the best goal scorers need to find ways to get in the net. And when I watch him play, he has about, I don't know, like a two foot release range. Mm -hmm. He can like way, way outside and shoot it past shin pads or pull it way into his toes. And like that's, you know, two, three feet, which is enough to sling it past most defenders and and i don't know if that's because analytics or work but like i think a lot of people watch austin matthews who pays a lot of attention to that a lot of the best goal scorers in the league now say we watch austin his release his shot the way he, he works on things and they want to do similar kind of stuff and i watch him shoot the puck that's what stands out not that he shoots it hardest but he has a real gift at getting it past shot blockers because he's got that wide release point range depending on what kind of shot he wants he wants to use and He's an, he's an awesome player, one of the best in the league and a really good situation with good line mates and a really good team. So, yeah, I'll be uh, listening to that one. And I like that anyone who likes information, I appreciate it. Pierre, what and stood plus, out to you? Yeah. Well, it's, what stood out to me is he revealed he's a Dallas Cowboys fan. So, oh, yeah, I'm a Jason Robertson fan Johnny for the rest makes of my this, life now. I mean, Johnny that's... makes this amazing point about the mechanics of his shots and all. And, and you pull out of the interview, he Go likes boys. my Cowboys. Go Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> and and and, he, and and before we started the interview uh, with Jason Robertson, he had the same glow about him than, that that I had. And Rashad was all because Rashad doesn't follow the NFL. And he much. was so confused about why because the Eagles lost. Correct. They're both happy, <laughs> reveling in the Eagles' defeat. Angry yeah, NFC East that. fans. Angry <laughs> NFC East fans. Oh, that's you awesome. got it. Great job today, guys. Thank you kindly. Our interview with Dallas Stars forward Jason Robertson is coming up on the other side of the break. Stick around here on Got Your Back. NHL, LeBron, Rashog, and MJ. We want to tell you about a truly Canadian company. Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals provides equipment and supplies to all facets of the Canadian construction industry. But what sets them apart is their get-or-done attitude. It's a core value of their company. I've been to the offices, 
I've seen how they proudly display that on the wall at each branch. Every one of the staff members lives by the get her done formula to ensure they'll never let their customers down. They'll bend over backwards to get their clientele what they need when they need it. And they don't make excuses. Cross Country Canada takes great pride in this attitude and they truly believe that the success of their customer is their success. You can't get much more Canadian than that. All right, time now for Who's Got Your Back, brought to you by Liberty Smart Security, our interview segment with Dallas Stars forward Jason Robertson. Liberty Smart Security is a company that specializes in having your back. Advanced, high-quality smart security systems for your home or your business, Liberty Smart Security uses leading-edge technology to protect the things that you value most in life. Your home is your castle. Protect it with Liberty Smart Security. So uh, Jason Robertson is having a heck of a year, and as Mike Johnson just talked about, it started out, people weren't sure what it was going to look like, because when you miss training camp and you have to join the team mid-stride, you never know exactly what you're going to get. But Robertson came out like a house on fire and has been dynamite for the Dallas Stars. We talked to him about a number of different topics, including being born in California and uh, raised by parents who had to go to all kinds of different lengths to keep him and his brothers on the ice. So much appreciated that uh, Jason Robertson took some time to chat with us. Presented by Liberty Smart Security, here is the Dallas Stars forward. Born in Arcadia, California, Jason Robertson joins us now. Jason, I was doing some reading on your background, and the story that I think stuck out the most to me was this idea that your mom and dad were hauling you around in an RV in the Los Angeles heat from rink to rink to try and get you more opportunity to play and more ice times. What do you remember about sitting in the back of an RV on those LA highways in that traffic? Ah, uh, well, I remember getting dressed in the in the, in the RV. Um, I, I know it's getting from where I was in uh, what what grade it would have been third, fourth, fifth grade. It was probably an hour, hour and a half to get to mm. El Segundo or um, Westminster or Lakewood, wherever we're going. So um, my parents just figured um, get us an RV and. We had three kids, so three ki- three boys playing hockey. So we would have, uh, you know, one kid skating four to five, five to six, and uh, while one's you know going on the ice, the other one will just rotate, come back in the RV, and um, you know eat and uh, do our homework and everything. So it was pretty convenient. And eventually, they ended up getting cable on it and uh, watching TV and stuff. So it was uh, it was pretty uh, sure pretty cool, and uh, it was also nice when uh, it'd be nine nine. 9 30 10 drive it back and we'd uh flip the couch and lay on in and it's a lot, a lot of work for my parents driving but uh yeah they made us feel very comfortable you know what stands out to me about that story you were changing in the rv i know what hockey gear smells like man what, <laughs> what does this smell like in that rv with three boys and hockey gear in there with you yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I actually don't remember it being that bad, but uh, now I think about it, I don't know if we aired out a year that often when we were 10 and 9, 8 years old, so um, I, I think my mom probably did it for us, uh, thank, thanks for her to that, but uh, yeah, probably maybe some scents, uh, scent, uh, scent things, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm not sure, I don't remember that much, but uh, and now you think about it, it's kind of gross, kind of sweaty, but uh, yeah, whatever. You do what you gotta do. Yeah, yeah. I, I got three kids playing hockey, and I don't, uh, I don't try not to go to the storage room where all the three bags are, are sitting yeah. in the day. Um, you know, and your path is is so fascinating to me, Jason. Uh, you know, you, you played in the Ontario Hockey League. I'm based here in Toronto, and you played Don Mills AAA before that. And I wonder if you could talk about your decisions as a family to to take that path, because obviously that actually used to be more common for American kids to come up and and play Canadian Major Junior, but obviously us development has grown so much over the years you actually see it less i find and and so what what brought you up here as far as your path yeah well uh when i was 14 uh, i finished playing for detroit kings in uh, in detroit area and um i kind of had an idea of where i wanted to do uh, i live right next to the where the plymouth whalers used to play um in uh in in plymouth uh, now the program plays there ironically but um, so I was very familiar with kind of the yeah. OHL, you know, players coming through there, um, going to the games and everything, and uh, kind of understood, like, what the league was about. And when I was around that age, you kind of know, like, what the next step is after your minor midget year. 
whether that would be junior in the USHL program, you know, the US program, the, the CHL and everything, but uh, kind of made that decision to go play in Toronto. We had a uh, new Lindsay Hoffer. He was the guy who brought me over there, uh, played for Don Mills. And uh, I think after that, I got drafted in the OHL and the USHL, but uh, yeah, I ended up uh, trying out for the, the front act and making the team there. And um, yeah, and then it just uh, kind of uh, took off from there. And my little brother followed those same footsteps and everything. So right, um, yeah, it was. Uh, it, we kind of made that decision when I was thirteen, fourteen, because I because I figured the OHL was, you know, the, all the all the talent it produces and uh, all the players that come up from the CHL, um, especially in that area, you know, Toronto, uh, Detroit, that area. It's just something that I thought you know was the fastest route to get to the, the NHL and to get to pro hockey, which is what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted mm-hmm. to do that, so um, just completely focused hundred percent on hockey, and uh, that's that's why I went there. I want to get to the season that you're having now. We'll talk lots about that in a minute. Just last question on on kind of the background. You know, I was also reading a, a quote from your mom where she, you know she talked about how you guys you really only considered yourselves to be you know from California basically, but when you got onto the large stage that is the National Hockey League, the Filipino descent, you know, that is on your mom's side is something that you started getting attention for and started getting approached by people, you know, of various backgrounds, talking about how inspiring it is to see someone of your background playing where you're playing. What was that experience like for you? And and what's your experience now in dealing with those communities? Because that's not necessarily that common a hockey background. Yeah, well, it's obviously special. Um, Very humbled to be a role model for those uh, types of of communities, um, especially in the Filipino community, I think it's really neat. Um, but you know, like I, my mom said, when I was growing up in California, you know, it was significantly, predominantly, uh, you know, diverse. You know, there were a lot of uh, Hispanics, Asians, um, a lot of sorts of different people. So it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't really new to me when I. Uh, well, it was new to me when I went to Michigan and realized it wasn't, uh, it wasn't similar like that. But obviously, um, you know, there's a lot more people in California, so. Um, that, that is what it is. So, but now at the big stage, I mean, it is starting to get more diverse. You know, you see the kids, uh, from different communities, especially in Texas, uh, heavily diverse area, um, a lot of different people. And that's, uh, a great, uh, opportunity for me to be in this type of market in this type of, uh, uh, community. And, uh, I mean, with the help of the Dallas stars, I mean, we're really branching out in all sorts of places. So, uh, I'm very honored to be uh, a big part of that. You know, the NHL draft has always been an inexact science. And, and when you look at you becoming a superstar in the NHL and, you know, going in the second round in 2017 in the draft, I understand that, that it happens because it is an inexact science. But what do you remember feeling yourself about, you know, being drafted the second round? Did you know in that moment that a lot of teams made a mistake or was it more about, hey, I still got work to do here? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the draft's the draft. I kind of, um, it was easy for me to uh, think about it the second time because my brother kind of went in a similar situation um, mm-hmm. when he was he was not picked in the first, then went uh, early second or mid second, and uh, similar situation. But I think back then you're just, I don't know. I mean, you're you what was I eight seventeen at the time? And you're kind of like right. you don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, your agent, your family especially your family are the ones that, uh, you know, were right next to me in the thick of it. Um, but at the end of the day, teams needed what they needed. Uh, they have shopping lists, right? So uh, obviously I don't hold any grudges against that. And, um, but I do remember after, because it was, it was hard when you're kind of on the, on the cusp of the, the first and the second, because they have two separate days. Two different uh, days, right. So that's, yeah. uh, that's, uh, that was a little tough because you knew, okay, you were there the whole first day and you know that, you wait until you get to the very last and you weren't, but um, I guess the good thing is you get excited for, uh, you know, the second round, right? Cause you know, or hopefully you get uh, picked relatively early, which I did. And um, kind of reminds me when I was in, in junior, when I got drafted to uh, Kingston, um, fourth the first round, three, yeah, the four, yeah. I was the first pick in the fourth round. And um, the first three rounds were on a internet broadcast. Right. right. So they had people picking it on, they call it in, and then I forgot who announces it, but they announce it and say, this guy goes to that team. So uh, they did the first round, they did the second round, and they did the third round. And then the show ended, and 
you know, I'm like, oh boy, it's gonna be a long day. And uh, I eventually turn close the computer and get a call from Guy from Kicks and said I got drafted. So it was kind of a, sim- a little similar situation, but um, I mean, you know, that's all water on the bridge now. And uh, I'm excited that uh, I'm here in Dallas. Does it make it a little bit easier that to their first two picks they grabbed, oh, Miro Heiskanen and Jake Ottinger in front of you? Like, <laughs> what a draft. What a couple yeah. of rounds for the Dallas Stars, man. Yeah, no, I remember when they got drafted. Uh, I didn't I didn't know who they were when they were drafted, but yeah. um, when I got picked from Dallas and um, head was spinning, and then I, you know, asked, like, who they pick ahead of me? And, you know, they said Dow, uh, Miro, and, um, and, and Jakey. So they got their goal and D. And, I thought, okay, cool. I'm their their first four they picked, so that was pretty yeah. cool. Right, Come on, you were thinking, you were thinking, who are these guys? I'm gonna bury these guys at camp. <laughs> I'm gonna show well, them. I'm like, little yeah. bit, little bit. Yeah, well, then I met Jakey and, and Robin Camp and everything, and found out it was a BU guy. So <laughs> very good. So let's get to the here and now. Listen, you're having a fantastic season. Uh, sitting at 33 goals already, you're on that 50 goal pace. Um, I noticed with your shots, you're shooting the puck on average one more per game than you were before. It's not like guys get on a heater goal scoring wise and look at their shooting percentage and you're like, ah, you're not shooting on a, on a heater, but you are shooting the puck more. I just wonder about refining that skill. And if that was a conscious effort to try and push your goals to the next level. Yeah. I think more so this year than last year, I tried to, uh, one, um, I mean, I look at analytics, I think analytics, for me is very important. I take that, take a lot of pride in analytics. I know a lot of, a lot of players don't like that. They don't really look at it you know, they just want to play, but I'm big on, um, I mean, last year I had 150 shots blocked, right. And I had a hundred missing that or something like that. So, uh, that was conscious decision for me to not get my shots blocked and try to get shots through and not try to, uh, really force anything. But, um, I how mean, is I that this year? In. How's that yeah, going I, this year? Well, you know, now the blocks. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's hard because now I'm on, you know, when you try to force shots, shots and uh, they get blocked, you kind of, you know, look yeah. at this sheet because we had the sheet afterwards and Joe hands me the sheet and I get four shots blocked and a little rattled or, you know, three missed shots or net and everything. So, but I mean, with the more attempts, obviously it's going to happen. But uh, I, sp- I think this year I kind of keep that in mind not to try to force things through three or four, you know, bodies, but. Um, that, you know, could be one of the reasons why I more shots on that. So I don't think the attempts are – maybe the attempts are a little more um, this year, but uh, I think getting him through and not uh, missing the net is something that helps get that number up too. And, and just one more on that. Sorry, Pierre, but you're 58% right. Corsi for this year. Uh, you're plus 26. I don't know if plus minus matters to you or not. But when you say you pay attention to analytics, is there another layer beyond just shot attempts and blocks that you actually pay attention to in value? Are you a expected goals guy, Corsi? What what else for you? Um, I mean, not really, because I know that that's a lot of uh, different variables going to that stuff. I mean, it is a team game at the end of the day. Um, so you know, your Corsi could be bad because you know we're all just not playing really well. It, uh, we're just getting dominated by by one team, so it's hard to keep track. I mean, uh, I think ozone possession times important stat. Um, really, kind of that is uh, is one that I look at because that's kind of individual. You know, how long you can hold on the puck or how many puck touches you get. But um, mm-hmm. more so with the team stuff. I mean, I look at all the team stuff before the games. And, um, I mean, it, it's not a lot of you you can control as an individual out there. You're playing with four you know, elite players. So, but um, I mean, it's some, something I like to try to keep in mind. You talked about the team aspect. You've been on the same line more or less for a couple of years now, which is uh, unheard of in today's NHL. It used to be more commonplace back in the day, uh, but playing with Joe and Rupi, when everyone's healthy, you guys are pretty much always together. And, um, you know, for you guys to stay together, that's got to be pretty consistent. That's what you guys have been. But what do you think you all bring to each other to make it work so consistently? Yeah, well, I mean, like you said, um, you know, it's my third year. I think I played in the same line with them consistently, like you said, when we were healthy for pretty much two and a half years, I think, so far. Um, so, I mean, after that, you kind of start to realize what, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, you kind of know what, where guys are going to be. Um, I mean, how long guys are going to stay on the ice, uh, when they're going to change, you know, when, when they're going to. Um, go for check or, or whatnot. So it's kind of, you kind of build that uh, instinct where you know guys are going to do. And that's 
obviously a significant advantage if you have that type of, uh, of chemistry, as people say. And, um, but I mean, you know, just with, with Rupe, you know, his speed and everything and Joe's is the way he can break pucks out is, is pretty important and make slippery plays and, uh, you know, get, get us the, get us the puck so we can get up the ice and, and get humming. So, um, everything's, it, yeah, it's been working so far these couple of years. Uh, it's, I know, um, uh, it's actually, I think it's the uh, anniversary of my first game today, three years ago, Joe. Oh, wow. I bet, bet you didn't know that. I, I, so. I did not know that. Back no, I know. I'm just looking at the, but... I, just, I, just got a, I just got a memory on my phone. That's funny you know that. <laughs> What's the memory on the phone? Oh, well, it's like um, on my way to Toronto um, to play my first game. All right. So, yeah, right, cool. so I what, think it's what you, to yeah, today. 213. It's first game? Yeah. Yeah, there it is. One assist? One assist, yeah. First game, three years ago. There you go. Time flies. In a pandemic um, in between. Yeah. It's the second time now that you've mentioned to me, uh, when you were here in October, I was writing a story on, on Joe Pavelski and I asked you to, you know, to talk about, and of all the things I thought you were going to talk about his game, because we know what a redirect master he is and everything he does in the offensive zone. The first thing you mentioned to me was his ability to chip the puck off uh, boards to get out of the defensive zone and transition. That would have never been the first thing that popped to mind for me, but you mentioned it again, and so so is it just one of those little elements that makes your line go essentially? Yeah, well, I mean, like you said, we played. Well, like I said, we played two and a half years of my career, so you pick up on everything. I mean, you pick up literally everything. You know what they're going to do in the D zone. You know what they're going to do in the neutral zone. Um, you know what what they can and can't do, right? So um, I think it's a significant part of the game. Uh, it's uh, it's very often overlooked. Um, breaking the puck right. out. Um, not having the poise uh, to be able to make that next pass up the ice is something that uh, obviously Joe, with his experience and his skill, has developed over his career. So uh, I think that's definitely overlooked. You don't you don't see that analytically. I don't, maybe you do see it analytically, but not certainly by not the points you see or or the, the right. basic stats. So, um, but as a player who is always on the ice, and you know you see that you see all the little parts of hockey games where uh, those pretty much win or lose games because that's one of the difficult, most difficult to th things to do to break the puck out clean. Last one for me, and then we'll get you out of here. Uh, you know, with you and playoff experience, you've had one go through, but I think about the bubble with you and the fact you were in the bubble and you were there and sort of bore witness to it all and maybe what that was like for you to be so close but not engaged, and now you've got this opportunity with a heck of a good team this year that could really do some damage. Just maybe how that bubble experience motivates you when you get another crack at trying to get there. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say the bubble, really. Uh, I mean, last year, for sure, that was when mm -hmm. I had my first experience. And uh, I mean, obviously, the bubble is significant. You know, they went all the way to the final, but uh, obviously, no fans. And, um, you know, I was just a little – Basically, a little kid, we are watching, you know, all these superstars playing the ice. I didn't play a game. I didn't play a shift. So, <laughs> is that uh, how you felt? I, yeah, I, I didn't play a shift. I took yeah. a couple, I practiced every day, um, went to all the meetings. Uh, I took warm ups twice. Um, but uh, I think nowadays, you know, when you're engaged and you're a big part, a uh, huge part of your team, it's something that last year uh, when we made it to, um, to seven in Calgary, that was. Um, something where you're like, you know, this is what you worked hard all season long, but you never realize how hard it is to get back to the playoffs and to be able to do it, to have a chance to do it again this year um, on this team. It's, uh, it's, it's hungry and um, gets me all excited because uh, it is hard to get to the playoffs and um, especially win a series and we're that close last year. And um, it only most motivates me to do more because now uh, I kind of have an idea what to expect, how loud it can get and uh, how awesome it is to play at the, Amer at the American Airlines Center in May. So it's pretty neat. Fantastic stuff. Hey, what do you make of uh, LeBron's Cowboys hat there? Are you, uh, you, uh, you a Cowboys fan living there? Or yeah, so I um, a lot of people, I don't know why, but a lot of players seem to like bag on me because I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan now. Good for uh, you. So, well, I mean, I figured you live there. I mean, <laughs> you kind of have that mutual, mutual respect for them. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm definitely, I would say definitely a Cowboys fan. 
uh, I was unfortunately devastated when uh, they lost to San Francisco, but you get used. Hopefully, to it. they'll be back next year. And um, yeah, they got uh, they got a good team. <laughs> right on. They Listen, do have Jason. A good team. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sure, guys. Yeah, I'm sure everything's going to be just fine. Uh, Jason, thanks so much. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, best of luck the rest of this year, and uh, we'll check in again. Perfect. All right, guys. All right, folks, that's going to wrap up the podcast. Thanks again to the Dallas Stars and Jason Robertson for joining Pierre and I. Big thanks to our sponsors as well, Cross Country Canada Supplies and Rentals, and, of course, our good friends over at Liberty Smart Security. We'll keep an eye on all things trade-related. If there are updates, we will do our best to bring them to you. Otherwise, have a fantastic rest of your day, rest of your week, and look forward to chatting again soon here on Got Your Back, LeBron and Rashog. Cheers, folks.